This is a production of Cornell University. All right, well, thank you all for coming, and thank you for inviting me. Um, this is my second trip to Cornell. I gave a seminar in Hort, the old Hort department, I guess about 10, 12 years ago, and I can't remember for the life of me what it was on, so <laughs> hopefully it wasn't on this. But um, what I'd like to do today is talk about uh, some of our work on CO2 concentrating mechanisms in higher plants, and I'll give a bit on the uh, C4 evolution story and some of the facets that we've been doing with that, and then I also want to talk about some interesting things we've observed that are going on in C3 plants to give you a nice sense that they're much more dynamic than we thought in terms of how they manage photorespiration and deal with the problems it causes, uh, and in some ways take advantage of it. So with that, I'll get started. And uh, this is an old graph that uh, Ed Tolbert put together from some years ago. Um, it's the bicycle diagram that shows C3 photosynthesis and photorespiration, and it's useful because it sort of gives a highlight of the start of our problem, which is the photorespiratory, uh, the photorespiratory challenge that plants face. So as you're all aware, CO2 here gets taken up by Rubisco and bound to RUBP in carboxylation to produce two PGAs, and then using energy in the form of ATP and NADPH, they're made into sugars, and some are regenerated back into RUBP to maintain the photosynthetic carbon reduction cycle. But in atmospheres of low CO2, like we've had in recent uh, millennia, oxygen can be taken up by Rubisco and bound to RUBP in the RUBP oxygenation reaction, and this produces one PG and one, uh, one PGA and one two-carbon molecule called phosphoglycolate, shown there as PG. Now the phosphoglycolate has no known use to the plant, and if it accumulates, it's toxic, so the plant has to deal with it. And using energy, they metabolize it back to PGA, but in the process lose previously fixed CO2, which is uh, a bit of a waste. And because oxygen is taken up and CO2 is given off, this is called photorespiration. Now, photorespiration has a strong environmental dependency in that warm temperatures and rising CO2 uh, influence the rate at which it occurs. If you're at high CO2, the CO2 suppresses the oxygenase reaction, and photorespiration relative to photosynthesis here is quite low, even at higher temperatures. Temperature promotes photorespiration by uh, promoting the oxygenase over the carboxylation reaction. And if you look at current CO2 levels, which are uh, now 400 ppm, but correspondingly in the chloroplast, they would be here where these circles are, as temperature rises, photorespiration can rise to quite high levels, as you see out here. And if you close the stomates, as you would do on a hot, dry condition, you can have photorespiration rates that can become exceedingly high and potentially exceedingly inhibitory. Now, to deal with this, uh, well, so this just shows the result of photorespiration on net photosynthesis. Here we have temperature going up. And at current atmospheric levels, or at least a few years ago, and 21% oxygen, a typical C3 photosynthetic response would be this with a big drop off at higher temperatures. Uh, but if you reduce photorespiration by going to 2% oxygen or high CO2, then you can see the impact of photorespiration by comparing the differences in rates. And you see that at high temperatures, this difference between a photorespiration-free and a photorespiration-inhibited C3 plant are quite large, not such a problem at low temperatures. Now, because of this strong inhibition, it's been understood for years that carbon concentrating mechanisms have evolved to deal with the problem. Um, and uh, the carbon concentrating mechanisms that would have evolved typically came up in dry environments here where much of the C3 flora has been inhibited by the photorespiration reaction due to the heat of a desert arid place like this as well as to stomatal closure to save water in these conditions which reduces CO2 around the chloroplast. Photorespiration is also a serious problem for much of the C3 flora in places like the tropical rainforest where high temperatures that you would often encounter uh, would lead to substantial oxygenase activities. 
Now, the most famous of the carbon concentrating mechanisms that have evolved is, of course, C4 photosynthesis, because a number of C4 plants are important for our food supply, and collectively it provides about a quarter of the total terrestrial primary productivity on the planet. Just a quick review, C4 photosynthesis has occurred when the reactions of the Rubisco and the C3 metabolic cycle are compartmentalized into the bundle sheath uh, and no longer expressed in the mesophyll tissue. And instead in the mesophyll, you've had the upregulation of the C4 metabolic cycle, which begins when PEP carboxylase takes PEP, carboxylate it to a four carbon acid, oxalo acetate, which is then reduced to malate in the most common form of C4. That travels to the bundle sheath where a decarboxylating enzyme, NAD malic enzyme, acts upon it to release CO2, produce NADPH, and then also create a three carbon residue pyruvate that has to go back and with energy be rephosphorylated to PEP. So with each turn of this cycle, CO2 gets pumped into this bundle sheath where Rubisco is localized raising CO2 to levels that suppress photorespiration. Now, uh, a key thing I just want to emphasize here <coughs> is that energy is required to drive this cycle so we can think of this as an actively driven, energy-dependent carbon concentrating mechanism. Two other well-known carbon concentrating mechanisms are CAM photosynthesis, which uh, you see here, which is basically the C4 type system only instead of spatially separated between a mesophyll and bundle sheath, it's temporally separated between day and night. At night, the stomates open, CO2 comes in, is carboxylated by PEP C to OAA, which is reduced to malate that's stored in the vacuole. During the day, the stomates close, creating a diffusive barrier. The malate is released, decarboxylated, releasing CO2, which builds up to um, uh, suppressed photorespiration at the Rubisco site. In a different group, the algae, many algae of all a wide variety of forms, you've had the evolution of a, a bicarbonate pump, typically where an ATPase pumps protons out, and in a co-transport mechanism they bring bicarbonate in, and then in a specialized compartment in the chloroplast called the pyranoid in eukaryotes and the carboxysome in prokaryotes, a carbonic anhydrase converts the bicarbonate to CO2, which then builds up to high concentrations around Rubisco and suppress photorespiration. Now again, I want to just emphasize ATP is needed here, so this bicarbonate pump is an actively driven CCM, and then in the rebuilding of the carbohydrate pool that will provide the PEP at night, ATP is needed, so the CAM system can be considered an active pump. So <coughs> in these active CO2 concentrating mechanisms, you need the energy to concentrate the CO2. The Rubisco is localized to a CO2 enriched, re enriched region, and you have a resistive barrier to slow the efflux of CO2. In the C4, the resistive barrier is the bundle sheath wall. Um, in the CAM, it's the whole uh, epidermis with st closed stomates, and then in the algae, it's a combination of a water layer and the pyranoid or carboxysome uh, uh, boundary. So again, there's the examples of these active systems, and as you probably would, as I've mentioned, Raising the CO2 through this pumping mechanism reduces photorespiration. It doesn't get rid of it, but it reduces it down to a few percentage points of photosynthesis. A second key thing of these CCMs is that by raising CO2 up to these high levels, they overcome a, satch, a substrate, substrate saturation of Rubisco that's present in the current environment. So here we have the carboxylation capacity corrected for photorespiration. Here we would say have a curve at 30 degrees. This is just the Rubisco substrate response to CO2. Here's the current CO2 level, which you can see leads to substantial substrate limitation. And then if you raise the CO2 level to what you have in a C4 or a pyranoid, then you begin to approach CO2 saturation. So in a low CO2 environment, this is a substantial benefit that plants would have with active CCMs. 
Now, there's a lot of interest these days in how, when, and why active CCMs have evolved. And with C4, we've been working on this um, a bit in the last 15 years. I got onto this when I edited a book, C4 Plant Biology, in the late 1990s. And uh, a nice thing about editing books is you find out how well the field is really understood. And with respect to C4, I found out that when it came to evolutionary questions, things were pretty rudimentary. So sort of a state of the art at that time, we thought there were 25 independent lineages. We knew they all occurred in advanced angiosperms. There was speculation that C4 was maybe 10 million years old. The phylogenetic understanding was pretty poor. Um, and we knew there were a number of species that had traits that were intermediate between full C4 and full C3 type species. This phylogeny that Toby Kellogg published in the book in her chapter sort of summarizes it. Uh, here we have a phylogeny of the Caryophyllidae class, Caryophyllidae. And if we just look at Amaranthus here, which is a group known to have some C4 species, you can see that it's not well distinguished from other group species within the Amaranthaceae Chenopodiaceae alliance. Uh, we didn't know whether there were C3 species here because it hadn't been fully surveyed. And we didn't know whether there were sister groups that might have intermediacy. And this would be true of most of the clades where we could find um, C4 species being abundant. And so we really couldn't address evolutionary issues because of the rudimentary state of the phylogenetics due to low species coverage, due to an inability to know who were C3 and who were C4, and then also poor resolution. So beginning spurred on by this from the uh, editing job I did on that book, um, my coworkers and I, here's Tammy Sage, one of my coworkers, uh, we went to various herbaria around the world Kew, New York Botanical Gardens, Missouri Botanical Gardens. And we went to the herba this, uh, herbarium specimens in these clades where we knew C4 occurred, took little pieces of samples, and measured the carbon isotope ratios, uh, which uh, are easily distinguished between C3 and C4. So C4s have a carbon isotope ratio of minus 8 to minus 16. C3s are minus 20 to minus 32 easily determined with the mass spec at about $5 an assay. So we could do thousands of assays, and so we did thousands of assays on many plant groups. And then we teamed up with phylogenists from around the world working on these groups, Thomas Borsch, for example, with the Amaranthaceae. And we were able to get them to get, provide more detailed analytical phylogenetic assessments of the groups we were interested in. And then we mapped C3 and C4 onto these phylogenies. And so here's just the Amaranthaceae. And by doing this, having a more detailed phylogeny, because we had something to bring to the table, which is the isotopes, we then mapped it on. And in the Amaranthaceae, you can see cleanly there's five distinct origins of C4. Uh, in Amaranthus, in Erva, small one in Tetastromia, a smallish one in Alternanthera, and then a relatively large one in what we call the gomphronoids, a five genera group, uh, gomphrina and its allies. And now we could go and to these branch points and ask, what's going on here? Do, uh, do we have intermediate species? And can we put that intermediacy in a phylogenetic context? OK, here's one that we just published last year on the group Blepharus. We have a C3 ancestral clade that's in a sister position to a C4 clade. And we have this intermediate clade branching here that through a preliminary survey of Kranz type anatomy in the leaves looks to have a lot of intermediate states. And so now uh, in six weeks, I'm going to South Africa with my PhD student. And we're going to collect a bunch of these guys so that we can develop a living evolutionary model of C4. Now, between our efforts and efforts of others in the field, we've been able to come up with a pretty good map of C4 evolution in the, in the higher plants. And as you see here, uh, there's a cluster in the grasses, the sedges and grasses, or collectively the graminoids. There's a cluster in the Caryophyllales order. And then there's a number of scattered groups 
of varying sizes uh, in the angiosperms. And when we go and look carefully, we can identify over 60 independent lineages of C4 evolution, which is kind of surprising given that it's a fairly complex trait. Um, now, with this uh, ability to use the phylogenies, we can also go and use a molecular clock approach to estimate when C4 evolved in these distinct lineages. And my colleague Pascal Christian did this in a paper that uh, he published for grasses in 2008 and then we published for grasses and eudicots in 2011, which is summarized in my annual review here. And this shows the spread between the um, stem node and the crown node with the midpoint there for 46 lineages of grasses and eudicots. And you see that beginning about 30 million years ago, based on molecular clock approaches, the C4 lineages diverged from ancestral C3 lineages. And as you come forward in time, over the past 50 million years, you get more and more lineages appearing. Now we can link this up with changes in Earth's climate and atmosphere. So if we look at atmospheric CO2 content shown here, this beginning here correlates with a drop in atmospheric CO2 down towards levels similar to today. And consistently, geological studies have shown C4 isotopes and fossils, and then evidence of big expansion of C4 grasslands and other ecosystems in the subsequent 20 to 30 million year period. Now, recently what I wanted to do is look at this in a little more detail, and on the next graphs I'm going to show you responses related to the midpoint between stem and crown nodes uh, in these projected dates. So what I did is I went and was able to estimate the number of species for uh, each of the projected C4 lineages, and now we can estimate the time origins for 52 lineages, which are shown here, and what you can see is that <coughs> using the midpoint, just to keep the graph kind of clean, here's the range between crown and stem nodes. For the 52 of the 60 lineages, you can see that the older lineages are the ones that have become the most speciose, with three grass lineages, chlorodoids, andropogonae, and the Melindae group being the most speciose. The eudicots, which tend to be about as old as the grasses, the older ones are more speciose. And as you come down to the younger groups, such a, um, you find that in grasses in the red triangles, eudicots in the black circles, and sedges in the blue symbols, in the last five to 10 million years, all the groups are fairly small in terms of species number. And then we can look at when these lineages occur, just the number of lineages as a function of the last 30 million years, starting here uh, 20 to 30 million years ago, and then a burst of evolutionary diversification in the last 15 million years. Now, this is a recent CO2 graph with oxygen isotope data that gives a climate proxy. I'll just focus on CO2. This is a paper out of Mark Pagani's group at Yale that used a number of proxies to estimate CO2 levels over the last 40 million years. Uh, here we are today, 40 million years ago, and at the time, 40 to 30 million years ago, CO2 levels are projected to be high by a number of complementary proxies. And then in the late Oligocene, about 25 million years ago, the CO2 level drops down, a little bit of a drop here, and then over the last 15 million years, it's been about what it was um, in recent geological time with a drop down to uh, below 300 ppm in the last ice age. Now putting on this graph from the previous panel I showed you to just allow you to look at CO2 versus C4 evolutionary diversification, you see in these higher CO2 periods a few groups diverged. Um, and then in the low CO2 periods of the last 20 million years is when most of them diverged. And then if you look right after this little drop from about 500 to somewhere around 400 ppm, that's where you get the greatest level of divergence. So that looks like changes in atmospheric CO2 were one of the uh, 
drivers or perhaps you will preconditions for evolutionary diversification of C4. Now we've been working on how C4 evolved and uh, beginning with work by Russ Monson in the genus Flavaria and continuing with many other groups I picked up on this you know, in, in the last 15 years and we've come up with a conceptual model for how you can build a C4 plant and it basically follows as I'll explain. So from an ancestral C3 condition, you have anatomical preconditioning, which we suspect might be things such as um, close vein spacing, high genetic duplication. Um, and then we, s you, we propose that you have enlargement of bundle sheath cells with more organelles in the bundle sheath cells so that the bundle sheath becomes physiologically engaged and activated. And then we have mitochondria, for some reason, moving to the inner bundle sheath wall. And together, at this stage, you get what we call the protocrans condition, because you see hints of crans anatomy starting in these otherwise C3 plants. And then you get a key mutation where you lose glycine decarboxylase expression in the mesophyll, and it's only expressed in the bundle sheath cells. And associated with mitochondrial enlargement and further elaboration of mesophyll to bundle sheath ratios, you get what's called a photorespiratory CO2 pump, uh, or a condition we call C2 photosynthesis. And once this is established, you get upregulation of the C4 cycle, which then leads to full C4 photosynthesis. So what I want to do now is to show you some of the evidence we have from two groups. Uh, heliotropium and neurachne, one's a eudicot, one's a grass, for this particular model. Okay, so before I begin, I want to just go over photorespiration a little bit so some of this might make sense. So here's the photorespiratory pathway. Uh, phosphoglycolate made by the oxygenation of RUBP is converted to glycine in the peroxisome. This goes to the mitochondria where an enzyme glycine decarboxylase acts upon it, releasing CO2 and serine, and the serine is made back to PGA, and the CO2 presumably is able to escape from the cell. <coughs> okay, now this CO2 under high photorespiratory conditions actually can be viewed as a resource, and if the plant can uh, compartmentalize the release of this GDC, it can actually set up a condition where this CO2 can drive improved photosynthesis. And so Russ Monson proposed some years ago that you get a specialization uh, of the photorespiratory pathway into two cell types, the mesophyll and bundle sheath. And this simply happens when you lose GDC expression in mesophyll uh, mitochondria. And if you have enough mitochondria in the bundle sheath, which you can have in a physiologically activated bundle sheath, then the photorespiratory glycine that's produced will have to flow from the mesophyll, which is much more voluminous, into the bundle sheath cells where it can be acted upon by GDC to release CO2. And any chloroplasts then that are nearby can take this CO2 and assimilate it at a much higher efficiency than would occur out in the mesophyll. So you would, in essence, then get a, uh, a CO2 concentrating mechanism formed simply by the relocalization of GDC. So we went into heliotropium section orthostachys, which Mike Froelich had identified as having C3, C4, and C3, C4 intermediate species. And taking leaf samples, we characterized their anatomy. We developed a phylogeny, which is shown here and we looked at some of the physiological and more recently some of the molecular traits. Now the species we collected are Heliotropium calcicola and tenellum here at the base of the orthostachys clade. We got Heliotropium kerwinskii and procumbens here further up the clade. We got a C4 Heliotropium texanum and then these two intermediates uh, Convolvulaceum and gregii. So you see a sense of evolution, phylogenetic um, progression from a distal to a more, or from a basal to a more distal series of branches, with C4 being acquired in the more distal branches. 
Now, here is the anatomical progression that we see as we move from a more basal to a more distal position. And this is typically C3, small bundle sheath cells without many organelles. In this heliotropium tenellum, you begin to see inflation of the bundle sheath cells, but not many organelles. Heliotropium Karwinskii, you begin to see sort of a rounding out of the bundle sheath cells into something that's sort of looking like yeah, preliminary first phase crans anatomy. Here's heliotropium procumbens with pronounced but smallish bundle sheath cells. And here we are in the intermediate heliotropium convolvulaceum, and you can clearly see a bundle sheath vascular patterning becoming more pronounced. And in the intermediate heliotropium gregii, it begins to look almost C4 like with big bundle sheaths. And then here are your C4s. Now the data compiled from this shows that the mesophyll tissues drop off in their percentage of the leaf cross sections in the C4s, but not so much in the C3s or intermediates. But the big change is a buildup of bundle sheath volume as you go along this, this phylogenetic gradient from the basal to the more <laughs> distal C3s and then into the intermediates and the C4s. And this is seen also as a reduction in mesophyll to bundle sheath ratio. Vein density doesn't change because the C3s have start out with a high vein density that's similar to the C4s, which might be a preconditioning trait. Now we look at organelle levels in these things. Uh, here we see organelles per bundle sheath cell. Uh, and this is for the chloroplast. This is for the mitochondria. And then this is looking at the position of those organelles, the percent of organelles in the inner bundle sheath, going from the basal species in that clade, the C3-ish guys, into the intermediates, and then finally the C4s. And you don't really see any C3 progression in chloroplast numbers. The intermediates have much higher chloroplast numbers. The C4s have variable. Um, this has few chloroplasts, but they're gigantic. The mitochondria in the C3s you see uh, relatively low here, but in the bundle sheath of Heliotropium Karwinskii, we see a significantly enhanced number of mitochondria, and then they get to be quite high in the um, intermediates. Now, the positioning, though, shows a dramatic change. As we go up the phylogeny towards the more distal branches, you see a progressive shift of chloroplast posi positioning from the outer half to the inner half, such that by the time you're in the intermediates, uh, most of the chloroplasts are on the inside. And the mitochondria seem to show the same shift. So there's one C3, a second C3, and a third C3 species as you're going from basal to the, the node that's sister to the intermediate and C4 branches. We looked at glycine decarboxylase localization. Here's the C3. Each of these brown spots is where you have staining for glycine decarboxylase in the mitochondria. This would reflect a mitochondria. And you see in heliotropium tenellum, the basal C3, it's scattered throughout <coughs> the mesophyll. Heliotropium karwinskii, which is a few nodes more distal towards the C4 clades. You see the glycine decarboxylase is scattered throughout the mesophyll, but you see this characteristic or this uh, interesting banding right around the inner part of the bundle sheath. Here we have tropium procumbens. You see that banding a little more strongly. This is physiologically a C3 species. And when you get into the intermediates, you see no decarboxylase expression out in the mesophyll, and it's all concentrated into the bundle sheath, especially along the inner half of the cell lining the vasculature. And here's another view in Heliotropium gregii, a C3, C4 intermediate. And Heliotropium texanum shows a typical C4 pattern where GDC is restricted to the bundle sheath. Now I wanted to look at what's going on in Karwinskii, uh, a C3 species physiologically, and here you see this vasculature, which is larger and more pronounced. It's not huge by C4 standards, but it's big by C3 standards. And here's the GDC stain, and you see there's a lot of GDC staining along the inner part of the bundle sheath cells. Here's the GDC out in the mesophyll, 
So we look at the transmission electron micrograph at what's going on, and there's very few mitochondria visible in this outer part, and instead they have lined up onto this inner part here where they are associated with a few chloroplasts. So we've had, in this C3 species that's sister to the intermediates, a polarization of mitochondrial distribution. Now when we go to the full C3, C4 intermediate heliotropium convolvulaceum, a very fairly pronounced bundle sheath enlargement, very pronounced GDC localization to the inner part of the bundle sheath, and when we look at it at the TEM, we see a very high number of mitochondria here, 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 and this cap of chloroplasts layering over them, and this is along this inner part of the bundle sheath. Here's another view here, and so <coughs> this then is the classic C3, C4 intermediate anatomy and physiology, and the idea is, is that photorespiratory glycine formed out in the mesophyll has to travel to these layer of mitochondria here to be metabolized and release CO2, which these chloroplasts can scarf up uh, with high efficiency. And here's a diagram of this mechanism where photorespiration produces glycolate, which is made into glycine. It comes into these mitochondria because mitochondria out in the mesophyll have no GDC. Mitochondria in the bundle sheath have the GDC. The CO2 is released upon metabolism of this glycine. Serine goes back to complete the photorespiratory cycle. This CO2 builds up to about three times, maybe four times what it otherwise would be, allowing these chloroplasts to operate at high efficiency. And the effect of this on photosynthesis is visible here. C3 photosynthesis, that photosynthesis is a function of intracellular CO2. In the C3s, you have a high CO2 compensation point, a shallower slope than you would in a C4, a uh, 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 slowly saturating response. And in the C2 type, this is based on C2, or uh, this is based on heliotropium, you have a reduction in CO2 compensation point, slightly bigger initial slope, and an overall improved photosynthetic performance at low CO2. Now, I switched into talking about C2 photosynthesis, and this is a term that I coined uh, to, ref to try and come up with something that physiologically describes this metabolism separate from the term C3, C4 intermediacy, which had been used previously. And it refers to the two carbons in this glycine molecule that shuttle CO2 into this internal compartment of the bundle sheath in a similar manner as the four carbons in uh, malate that sh shuttle CO2 into the bundle sheath in C4. And the reason I came up with this uh, is because we were running into confusion between what is a C3, C4 intermediate trait and what would be um, a physiology that could exist in a much wider range of plants than those that are evolving towards C4. Now, just quickly, another group, the Narachinae we've been studying, and this has C3, C, uh, C3, C4 intermediates, and C4 species. We collected eight in the wilds of Australia in sites like this. Here's the intermediate species, Narachinae minor, growing in a, in a pot, a, a rocky pothole that's been formed. And here I just want to show you bundle sheath and mesophyll, this is actually a specialized layer called the mesome sheath. It's not anatomically proper bundle sheath, but it's a vascular sheath layer. And I want to look at the mitochondria per cell, GDC per mitochondria based on um, the number of gold <laughs> particles appearing in an immunoblot stain, and the GDC per cell area, which is uh, GDC per mitochondria times the number of mitochondria. And I'm expressing this as a function of CO2 compensation point, where C3 values are high right here, and C4 values are the zero ones right there. Now, in the bundle sheath, we see the number of mitochondria per cell going up as we go to lower CO2 compensation points, and then it comes down into the C4. 
The GDC per mito goes up as we go to lower CO2 compensation points. And correspondingly in the mesophyll, the GDC levels per come down in a progression. And then the number of gold particles per cell area, which is a function of mitos and so on, you see going up. So you're getting a lot more GDC in the, bundle, in the sheath cells and a bit less out in the mesophyll. So you're seeing a similar pattern to what we see in heliotropium in this grass group of gradual enhancement of GDC in the, in the sheath cells while the mesophyll uh, expression goes down. Okay, now through the taxonomic or the phylogenetic work and the isotope work, we've now identified uh, a dozen independent <coughs> lineages where the C3, C4 intermediate condition is, is sister to the um, uh, C4 condition using this pattern of C2 photosynthesis. But we've also identified four clades with no evolutionary relationship between C4 photosynthesis and the expression of this C2 photosynthesis type metabolism. Now here we have this again, and what I want to emphasize, and this, I got to thinking about this and thinking about the fact that this metabolism does not necessarily have to be associated with C4 evolution, that it could operate as a bona fide carbon concentrating mechanism in its own right. And a key thing about this is no additional ATP expenditure is required. So you have a buildup of glycine from high photorespiration, and by a strategic relocalization of GDC into this one compartment where chloroplasts can be enhanced, you can affect CO2 concentration without spending any extra energy. So we have then a passive CO2 concentrating mechanism. And it's kind of interesting to think that in the case of C4 evolution, the evolution of this passive mechanism to scavenge photorespired CO2 laid the foundation or, or built the bridge, if you will, to the C4 condition by setting up this um, structural mesophyll to bundle sheath system. And upon this, you could then layer on the active C4 metabolic cycle. Now, this pyramid diagram just shows the diversity of photosynthetic CCMs. Inorganic pumping of bicarbonate, CAM, C4, and now the C2 passive type. But it got me to thinking, what might be going on in the C3s? Are they playing with photorespiratory CO2 to enhance rubisco efficiency? And so we decided to go and look for passive CCM type conditions in the C3 uh, flora. And I'd like to begin with rice. Now, we went and looked at rice mesophyll cells uh, as part of the C4 engineering project. And one of the things that struck me about these in this longitudinal section here is the chloroplasts form this dense layer around the periphery of the cell. Here you see a nice view of that. And the mitochondria here, 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 are all positioned to the interior of this chloroplast layer, which is quite thick. And where you have gaps between chloroplasts, as right here, you get these extensions forming where the chloroplast blebs out to form uh, a seal between the two of them and block off direct efflux roots out of the cell. Here we see transverse sections, and you see there's a chloroplast in these lobed protrusions of the mesophyll cell. Here's mitochondria to the inner part, and here's these extensions, what we call stromal extensions. And here's some high mags of the extensions. Here you see an extension sealing off a gap between two chloroplasts. Here's a bunch of mitochondria sandwiched between the chloroplasts. <coughs> here's a case where the chloroplast has actually been enveloped by these chloroplast extensions. And there's another case there. And this got us to thinking what could possibly be going on here. We did an immunogold blot for rubisco and found that in these extensions or stromules, you have rubisco present. Here's a mitochondria that's uh, blocked off from the periphery of the cell by this stromule extension. And so we then redrew the typical appearance of a C3 leaf to create it something like this. 
layered on the photorespiratory cycle. Here oxygen is being uh, taken up, carboxylating RUBP to form phosphoglycolate. The glycine then is metabolized by GDC in the rice mitochondria. CO2 is released, but it's released into this internal space, and the only way out is through a chloroplast or the stromial extension, which gives Rubisco a chance to capture and refix this CO2. And under f high photorespiratory conditions, this surge of CO2 produced could potentially enhance the amount of uh, CO2 in the chloroplast and improve Rubisco efficiency. So to test this, I formed a collaboration with Tammy Sage, uh, my faculty colleague, Ace of Cousins, Florian Bush is my postdoc, and in a paper published in PCNE a few years ago, we presented the results of our study. Now what we wanted to do is to measure directly the amount of fixation of photorespired and respired CO2 by chloroplast before it can leave the cell. To do this, we used a pulse chase system with carbon-13 where we first loaded the leaves with carbon-12, and then we all of a sudden switched them to carbon-13, a pure carbon-13 CO2 source. So assimilation of carbon-13 measured by a mass spec would give us photosynthesis this way, and then we'd be able to measure the respiration signal by the carbon-12 coming off, and the carbon-12 that was refixed here would presumably be coming from these mitochondria. Okay, and through a series of mathematical uh, calculations, we were able to estimate a number of things. And we did the measurements at 350 ppm and 30 degrees. And in rice, which has chloroplast coverage of the mesophyll of 99%, so 99% of the mesophyll exposed to intercellular spaces is covered by chloroplast. We measured the total reassimilation of photorespired and ri respired CO2 was about 51%, and 29% of that was coming from CO2 that was directly reassimilated from mitochondria. And we modeled then that the increase in chloroplast CO2 due to this was 14 ppm, and this led to an 11% enhancement of photosynthesis. Now we repeated the measurements at 200 ppm, which was the CO2 level 20,000 years ago. Here the total reassimilation was estimated at 59% of respired and photorespired CO2. Intracellular reassimilation was 38%. We estimated that the CO2 concentration inside was enhanced by 16 parts per million from this photorespired CO2, and that boosted CO, uh, photosynthesis by 33% over what it otherwise would have been. And at these low CO2 conditions, this level of enhancement is actually starting to become substantial. We did the same for wheat. Wheat also sh forms these stromules. Here's a mitochondria and there's two stromules. This is the view you would get if you were looking at the wheat cell standing face on. And you can see the high coverage of chloroplasts with only a few gaps between them. And so this effectively forms a cage that will force photorespired CO2 through, through the chloroplast as it's diffusing from the mitochondria to the outside of the leaf. And we just did these measurements at 350 ppm, and we estimated that the CO2 concentration in the chloroplast from this photorespired CO2 being forced to leave through the chloroplast was 14 ppm, and you have an 11% enhancement of photosynthesis as a result. So we call this refixation of photorespired CO2, um, and a question is, how widespread is this? So if you go, for example, into the C3 flora of the Mojave Desert, or say the subtropical Australian woodland, how many of these species would have evolved a mechanism to trap and refix this photorespired CO2, and thus compensate for the hot, uh, dry conditions that you would have in these kinds of environments? And so one of the things we want to do in coming years is actually screen wild populations in these environments prone to photorespiration for this kind of uh, anatomy. And it raises a paradox of the modern biosphere, which is the CO2 concentration in the recent atmosphere was quite low. It got down to 180 ppm 20,000 years ago, which in the tropics was 
cause high levels of photorespiration. It averaged around 230, 240 ppm throughout the ice age, based on ice core records. Um, and so these conditions would be strongly inhibitory because of increased photorespiration. You had C4 plants out there who would have provided very strong competition, yet despite all of this, 90% of the Earth's plant species are C3, and most of the C3 plants occur in the tropics. Most of the low latitude biomes are dominated by C3s, and C4 is actually rare and absent in most life forms such as trees and vines. So although C4s do well in certain situations like grasslands, they are not the dominant vegetation of the warm parts of the planet, even in these very low CO2 times. Um, and so we're wondering whether recycling a photorespired CO2 is a way to um, offset or compensate for these low CO2 conditions. Now, <coughs> we've come up with the term passive CO2 concentration to describe the C2 photosynthetic system that can lead to C4 or can exist independent of any C4 evolution. And we've described uh, some of the criteria that would fit a passive CO2 concentration. So CO2 around some rubisco is enhanced by strategic placement of mitochondrial CO2 assimilation, or CO2 emission. No extra energy is required, hence the passive aspect. You need a resistive barrier to slow the efflux of mitochondrial CO2. The rubisco needs to have specifically enhanced photo, uh, CO2 and photosynthesis in these regions where the photorespired CO2 is being released. And if this system is specifically selected for by natural selection, you could argue that it's a bona fide adaptive feature um, in and of its own right. And of course, if it enhances carbon gain and fitness. So I've described C2 photosynthesis, but we're arguing that this mechanism seen in rice and its allies here is also a passive CO2 concentrating mechanism. It's not a huge impact, but especially at low CO2, it's a significant impact that could maybe enhance plant fitness enough to offset the potential uh, for, say, out competition by C4 plants. Now, when we think about passive CO2 systems, we've got to move and think beyond just photorespiration, but also respiratory CO2. And where you get thick respiratory CO2 tissue, such as stems or fruits, then by putting a barrier in place, you can actually have a passive CO2 concentrating mechanism. So here we have the stem of a birch, and you have this particular sclerotic layer, a sclerenchyma layer in the outer part of the stem. Here's the phloem parenchyma, and the chloroplasts in the phloem parenchyma are autofluorescing, showing that they're fairly potentially physiologically active. Respiratory CO2 produced in this stem could diffuse out but get held up by this sclerenchyma layer and potentially build up to a point where photosynthesis in this phloem layer and maybe down here in the pith layer is enhanced so that rubisco can operate very efficiently. In selaginella, you have a condition where a thick cortical layer could provide a resistive barrier. And then you have these lacunae that form and diffuse up from below ground tissues, bringing respired CO2 with them. And by lining these, and by lining these below ground, or these lacunae from below ground with chloroplasts, the CO2 that's coming up from below ground from roots and tuber or rhizomes, and even soil respired CO2 could allow these chloroplasts to operate with high levels of efficiency. So these may fit the criteria of a passive CCM. And it would be worth going back and looking at many of these species to see if these are specific adaptations to improve the carbon balance of these plants um, in geological times of low CO2. OK, so if uh, that's it. Uh, just a quick thanks to my funder, NSERC, my various postdocs and grad students uh, who have worked with me on the project, Pascal Christian, who we collaborated with on a lot of the phylogenetics. And with that, I'll take questions. <coughs>
the obvious question is why don't all the seats of the Palms do this? They may. <laughs> do what? Do, do, do which of these? The, the, traffic, the traffic measures. But that rice test. Yeah. Uh, they may. We've looked at uh, half a dozen crop species and they all do it to some degrees. Some of them don't do it as much as rice. Rice and wheat stand out in having a very high chloroplast number so you get that complete sheaf around the periphery. That's expensive in terms of uh, nitrogen and other things and when you go to low nitrogen you see the chloroplasts becoming fewer in number and they spread apart. Gaps form between them and then you see the refixation potential going way down as CO2 presumably leaks out much more readily. So there's a cost associated with it. Um, but one of the things you see in the C3 plants is the chloroplasts tend to be very thin and pushed up against the periphery, indicating that evolution is made for these small, thin chloroplasts, but a lot of them. Uh, when you go to the C4s, for example, you don't have that. You have fewer chloroplasts and many of them are much bigger because they don't have photorespiration occurring out in the mesophone. So they don't have this evolutionary uh, imperative to have to deal with. So, yeah, but most seem to have the ability to do this if they have enough nitrogen and can build enough chloroplasts. Yeah. So obviously there's, there's potentially a lot of inputs to making this decision between having a C2 mechanism or that, but how about temperature? Because temperature affects the CO2 and oxygen solubility, do you see with increasing temperature among C3 species a greater propensity of uh, C2 concentrating? All the C2 concentrating mechanisms and all those clades that I showed you uh, are very high temperature climate plants. Okay, so if you go up to lower temperatures, then you see less of them. You don't see any of those. Yeah. Yeah, so the C2 mechanism that we see, um, all those groups that are listed here. Actually, I think, let me see if I got a picture of one of these guys growing in its natural habitat. There. This is the natural habitat for C2. This is the Mojave Desert. Surface temperature here during the growing season is 65 Celsius. The leaves are working around. Uh, here's the leaf temperature. Um, starts off at 20 degrees. By the middle of the day, it's approaching 50. This is its growing season, and it's supported by monsoon rains that provide summer moisture. Um, so at this condition, especially at 300 or 280 ppm, the pre-industrial CO2 level, that would be really high photorespiration. So that's a big slug of CO2, which on the one hand, you could just let it go away, or on the other hand, by strategically placing your GDC, then now all of a sudden it's a great resource to, to exploit. Yeah. So following up on that a little bit, I mean, I buy that C2 is a precursor for whatever the C4, but um, why is C2 maintained? Do you see sec environmental segregation between C2s and C4s? You might have expected everybody that's in that kind of environment to eventually evolve towards a C4 and C2 to no longer be um, extant. Yeah. Um, well, everybody in this kind of environment, um, I mean, C3s do do well, but they may be doing well because they're kind of sitting still and it's this hot. They use early morning hours and close their stomachs and sleep through the afternoon. They take a siesta. Or they may be operative off-season during the winter or something. So you do see a lot of the C3 flora, such as um, some of these guys, just shutting down when it's this hot. And there are C4s in that same environment? These grasses. Yeah, there's some cores. Now, one of the things about these C2s is they tend to occur in these oddball environments, or they tend to occur as weeds. So, for example, the one that occurs around here is uh, a Molugo verticillata, which is called carpet weed, and it grows on people's patios and lawns in July and August. It's, it's a fugitive species, so it sort of uh, escapes competition by growing in these opportunistic but hot sites. So if you have a black top in your driveway and you don't pull your weeds, you're gonna get carpet weed growing in Cornell in this kind of otherwise moist climate, but it's a very hot microsite on that black top. 
Um, so yeah, these guys grow on these very extreme sand dunes, rocky surfaces, gypsum surfaces, uh, or they grow where there's low competition due to extreme or recent disturbance. Um, so they're kind of escapists. The reason we think that is because once C4 evolves, as the gas exchange diagram I showed you, it's superior and it just excludes these guys out. They're, they're not strong competitors, whereas the C4s are. Dave. Um, you, it was a great, fascinating you know, the work that's been done in the elucidation of the anatomical evolution. You didn't mention much about pet carboxylases versus rubisco. And I wonder if you could just say a word about pet carboxylase, where that fits into the history, whether there were other avenues of evolution in pet carboxylase analogs, and also kind of related to that, could there be some reason why pet carboxylase is a challenging enzyme either to evolve or simply for a plant to maintain that reduces the prevalence of C4? Well, um, so <coughs> pet carboxylase is, uh, the problem it has in the existing C3 metabolism is that it doesn't lead to net CO2 fixation. So it, it's a gateway into the Krebs cycle, but the carbon it produces, OAA, a Krebs cycle intermediate, and then malate, to run it through the Krebs cycle, you have to go off that CO2 fix during Krebs cycle metabolism. So you don't get net fixation. It's, it actually serves as sort of a gateway in and out of the Krebs cycle, and, and in and out of fatty acid metabolism and other things that need the Krebs cycle. So to re-engineer pep carboxylase to fit into a net CO2 fixation loop, <coughs> you may have to go and screw up the Krebs cycle metabolism, which would be a pretty big deal and challenging for plants. Pepsiase itself is quite ubiquitous in plants. It's used in many physiological functions and it's there in, in all of the land plants. Um, so using it is not a problem, you just need to upregulate it. But you have to couple it with something that leads to net CO2 fixation. And the only carboxylase in eukaryotes that we know does that is, is Rubisco. Now maybe if we wanted to get into synthetic biology and genetically engineer a completely new photosynthetic thing, we could pull a bacterial enzyme out, a bacterial carboxylase, and then put in some things and create a new fixation scheme, and that's been discussed, but um, technologically, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, um, <clears throat> as you follow the uh, evolutionary speciation-based trajectory from C3 to C4, and the increase in the importance of metabolite transport between the bundle sheet and mesophyll cells, do you follow that? Do you see increasing number of complexity of plasma between well, that's something, that's something we actually want to go to all, all of these uh, intermediate guides. We got most of these in collection now, or various stages of them. Uh, go back these guys. So we have most of these in collection, but most of them only have a few. So you can't really get an evolutionary progression because you only got one or two intermediate stages. Okay, and most of them seem to fix on the pure C2 metabolism. So there's not a lot of variation. The different, the exception is the area here with mine, but then this one blepharis that I mentioned it, that we just did the phylogeny on, it could have up to 30 intermediates. And based on a preliminary screen with the variant material, it looks like there's quite a bit of variation in this intermediate uh, series of traits. That's where you can go in and look at when, along this so-called evolutionary progression, you get step changes or gradual changes in the buildup of plasma as model, or changes in uh, mesophyll chloroplasts, uh, which we've done for Flavaria. We look at where this change in mesophyll chloroplast number occurs, and it seemed to occur progressively. That's just coming out now in plant cell and physiology. So yeah, we can do that kind of thing, but we need to have very species intermediate groups. Do you have any last question? Sorry, <laughs> Jim. Among all these phylogenetic studies, have you uh, seen any evidence that C4 breaks down and falls back to the C2? Regress? Uh, yeah, there's a few minor things. Um, Allotropsis has pretty good evidence for a reversion. Uh, 
there's probably a reversion in um, acanthate in um, the um, Sisuvioidi group in the um, um, which is in uh, oh I forget the name of this family now but there's good evidence for reversion there in a group called Sisuvium the genus but and there's possibilities in the Chenopodiaceae that you've had loss diversification of the reconstituted C3 and then reacquisition of C4 from that but is that a real loss in reacquisition or is that multiple evolutionary events and we need much finer phylogenetic detail to be able to address those hypotheses and that's one of the priorities for coming years is to go into these groups that look to be fairly dynamic and see whether they're dynamic or whether you just got multiple C4 spinning off of some predisposed C3 ancestor. So. I'm afraid we have to stop the discussion for the same goal. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.